Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 119, part 1, June 26th to July 2nd, 1863. Last week, we had a very busy time. We talked about the cavalry actions in Virginia leading up to the invasion of the North. We also had the Tullahoma campaign in its entirety. This week we have ourselves an episode, though. We're going to get into the Battle of Gettysburg. Before I do that, though, I need to get into a quick little note. First and foremost, I want to just note that we are going to have a two-parter for this episode. Originally, I thought we would do the first and second day of the battle, but now that I'm taking a look here... I think it might be easier to divide it up. Secondly, I just need to say that Gettysburg is my favorite battle, as is probably it is for a lot of other Civil War enthusiasts. That being said, there's a lot of source material, and honestly, it's a little overwhelming to pick exactly what to focus on. Because of the sheer amount of material, there could be a lot of detail added, but unfortunately, I think for the purposes of the show and what it is, we may have to go not too far into the nitty-gritty. I hope that once our narrative is concluded, I can go back and cover these areas more in depth, and that's going to be an exciting avenue that I can pursue in order to continue to do episodes for the show, so definitely that will be something down the road. Also a quick note, of course we have Patreon content, and of course it's got to be Gettysburg. We're talking about the movie Gettysburg, and we're going to talk about exactly why it's probably the best Civil War movie out there. But, let's get into the battle. So the big question most folks start with is why Gettysburg? I've seen some pronunciation questions about Gettysburg, Gettysburg. It's uh, more accurately to be called Gettysburg, but I'll probably just keep using Gettysburg. I have known folks from that particular area, and that's That's what they use, so I'm going to go with the modern vernacular here. The classic story with Gettysburg is that the battle begins because of shoes, which is something many historians dispute, even if it's a nice little thing to say. But the real answer is kind of complicated. It's sort of, kind of. Remember that Lee does not have a sizable cavalry wing. We talked about that last episode. The Confederate commander is going to meet with George Harrison, the spy and associate of Longstreet, he's going to become concerned that the Federal Army is a lot closer than he previously thought. Consolidating his stretched-out forces would be important in order to meet new Federal Commander Meade and the Army of the Potomac. If possible, Lee would want to take the page out of the deceased Stonewall's book and defeat the enemy in detail. Remember, of course, the Valley Campaign unfolds like that. Ewell, who really wants to capture Harrisburg, is going to be disappointed and start heading back to Hill with Longstreet coming up as well. One possible place to start that concentration was going to be Gettysburg. Hill's men were at Cashtown, named as such because of an inn there that only accepted cash. It would not be possible for the entire Army of Northern Virginia to occupy this town, though. They would have to be spread out for forage, and to be otherwise adequately supplemented by the countryside. Remember that some folks call Gettysburg to be the greatest commissary raid in history. So, the purpose is to gather in supplies to forage, gather in supplies. So, they're going to need to be spread out in order to do that. And that's why I say that Gettysburg, when we say it's started because of shoes, is kind of, right? Because... They need to be gathering supplies. Shoes would have been one of the things on the priority list to acquire, whether or not the town is actually known for its shoes. But obviously they'd be looking for other things as well. Ewell was given frustrating orders, though. Essentially, Lee was going to give him the option of where to go. Heidelsburg was an option a little further east than Cashtown, north of Gettysburg. Dick Ewell will not be the kind of guy who can be given options. Remember, he is a good soldier and likes concrete orders. Hold that thought because it's going to affect our story. Now, all of that to say, though, that Pettigrew's brigade of Heath's division did approach outside of Gettysburg on June 30th. There, they are going to run into Federal cavalry under John Buford. 
Buford had already encountered the same rebel pickets in the vicinity of Fairfield, these troops deployed by Hill to protect the approaches to South Mountain, so he has a good idea of where the enemy is. Remember, too, that South Mountain has been screening Robert E. Lee's army as they track north. What is more, Buford will understand the significance of Gettysburg. It should be pointed out, too, that Lee and Meade understood the importance. Both of them would write that they thought that Gettysburg was probably a likely engagement point, but neither really wanted a battle. Lee wants his army to come together. Meade wants to consolidate his on Pipe Creek. But of course, the armies needed to locate one another, so Meade has John Reynolds on the case. Reynolds is given de facto wing command over his 1st Corps, as well as the 11th under Howard and the 3rd under Sickles. Now, Meade does not get along with Sickles, who is reprimanded on the march for slow movement, sort of telling him his honeymoon period under his pal Hooker is over, and this possibly affects the actions on the second day, so hold that thought. Reynolds is given a lot of leeway in deciding where a potential battle will be fought. He is considered by some to be mainly responsible for Gettysburg, and partly because he wants to meet the invaders in his home state potentially. Howard, fortunately, is going to spend some time with Reynolds and maybe share his vision, which is going to come into play. I've also seen that theory kind of walked back a little in that Meade would not have given Reynolds the supreme authority to figure out if they need to fight a battle, but they would have been acting under sort of his guidance. So I've seen that as well, kind of a counter, shall we say, to Reynolds being the one who kind of kicks off the ball. On June 30th, Pettigrew's brigade of Heath's division would march down the Chambersburg Pike toward Gettysburg. Even with Jubal Early already having moved through the town prior, on his way to York, Pettigrew was going to secure more supplies. They would encounter Federal cavalry under Buford and withdraw back toward Cashtown. Now Buford only has two of his three brigades. His favorite, the reserve brigade commanded by one of the three boy generals, Wesley Merritt, was detached. The other two boy generals are Elon Farnsworth and George Armstrong Custer, and they're going to both have their stories impacted by Gettysburg. Buford would make his headquarters at the Eagle Hotel and set up vedettes to watch the various approaches. His two brigades were under capable officers in William Gamble and Thomas Devon. While these men were confident, Buford was wary of how important a spot they held, as is captured in a quote the night before the battle from one of his staff officers. Buford marched into Gettysburg with his division on the afternoon of June 30th, and, passing through the town, Gamble's brigade encamped on the Cashtown Road, while Devon's brigade encamped on the road to Mombasburg. Gamble scouted toward Chambersburg, while Devon scouted the country toward Carlisle as far as Hunterstown, capturing a number of rebel stragglers, from whom important information was elicited. On the night of the 30th, General Buford spent some hours with Colonel Tom Devon, and while commenting upon the information brought in by Devon scouts, remarked that, the battle will be fought at that point, and that he was afraid it would be commenced in the morning before the infantry would get up. These are his own words. Devon did not believe in the early in advance of the enemy, and remember that he would take care of all that would attack his front during the ensuing 24 hours. Buford answered, No, you won't. They will attack you in the morning, and they will come booming. Skirmishers three deep. You have to fight like the devil to hold your own until supports arrive. The enemy must know the importance of this position and will strain every nerve to secure it, and if we are able to hold it, we will do well. Upon his return, he ordered me then first lieutenant and signal officer of his division to seek out the most prominent points and watch everything, to be careful to look out for campfires and in the morning for dust. He seemed anxious, more so than I ever saw him. On the other side near Cashtown, A.P. Hill would confer with Harry Heath, Heath, the new division commander, was anxious to try to get back toward the crossroads town. This would spark the famous quote from Heath, saying that he would want to go and try again for those shoes. Hill obliging. Hill, though, is not going to perform well in the next coming days. On the 30th, he is convinced that the Union troops are still in Maryland, and his lead division would encounter nothing but militia. Take just a little bit of time to describe the battlefield here. I want to just make sure that we kind of understand. So 
if you look at a map of Gettysburg, and I really think it's easier if you take a look at one, there are a lot of roads that come into Gettysburg, right? And that's part of the reason why the battle is fought there, because of all these roads. So it's sort of easy to understand the roads, the name of the roads, that's where they're headed. That's the direction they're going, right? So kind of in a clockwise from, let's say, around 8 o'clock, we have the Fairfield Road coming in from the southwest-ish. We have the Chambersburg Pike that comes in. That's where AP Hill is going to be advancing down. That's coming in from the west and a little bit to the north, say about 10 o'clock. 11 o'clock, we're looking at Momusburg Road. That's coming in as well. The Newville Road, that's coming in a little slightly off of 12. Carlisle Road, probably straight down 12 o'clock going into the town. Uh, and that's very close to the Newville Road. You have the Harrisburg Road that's coming in. That's probably closer to 1 o'clock. And then closer to 2 o'clock, you got the York Pike. 3 o'clock, you have the Hanover Road that's coming in directly from the east. And then the other big road that we should also mention is the Emmitsburg Road that's coming in from around, shall we say, 6 o'clock coming in from the south. And that's going to be having a lot of the main battlefield features that we like to talk about with Gettysburg. It's running by Devil's Den, the Peach Orchard, and then it's coming up into and in front of Cemetery Ridge. So that's kind of how those roads are coming into the town. All these roads are the north of the town, so we're, we're dealing with those primarily today. And of course, on uh, July 2nd, as the battle evolves and as the lines take shape, then we're going to be talking about some of these other places. July 1st would be a warm day, as many recalled. Pettigrew's brigade would once again take the lead, marching down the Chambersburg Pike. One of the cavalry vedettes of the 8th Illinois of the Irish Gambles Brigade would spot the oncoming rebels. Lieutenant Marcellus Jones would take a carbine from a sergeant, place it on a fence rail, and take a shot, generally considered to be the first shot of the battle. I have seen where this may not actually be the case, as well as maybe fighting actually had started in a different direction, so, but obviously that's going against the Gettysburg Cannon here. If you were to look at where Thomas Devon's vedettes were deployed to the north and east, it would actually kind of surprise you to know just how far out they are. And if you ever go to Gettysburg and you drive out to where Marcellus Jones takes the first shot, you kind of get that impression as well. And that goes back to our quote that we just talked about. Buford's really concerned about the oncoming rebels. He's going to do everything that he can to make sure there's ample advance warning. So these cavalry vedettes are going to be pretty far out. And that's also the importance of cavalry, too, is that they are able to be mobile enough to be far out in advance and let everybody know. Ewell would choose correctly and start moving his men in the general direction of Gettysburg. Remember that the cavalry under Jenkins is still attached to him. Jenkins and his cavalry would skirmish with one of the federal troopers, which might have preceded Lieutenant Jones, but it's hard to say. Everybody's, this is a common thing you hear in the Civil War, everybody's clocks are different. So if they say it was this time, then it's hard to tell if that's actually, you know, 4 o'clock or maybe it was like 3.30 or somewhere in between. So it's always difficult to tell. Just know that Yule is going to advance toward the guns and begin pushing back Devon. These cavalrymen are going to be the first eyes on the Rebel 2nd Corps showing up. Buford also has Battery A of the 2nd U.S., commanded by Lieutenant John Califf. Califf would deploy and start to get to work. He left an account of the fighting that we have here. Colonel Gamble, commanding the brigade, instructed me to select my own position, which I did on a crest in advance, and one we had occupied during the night. Leveling the intervening fences, the battery moved forward to the position selected, which was a good one for artillery. It was part of General Buford's plan to cover as large a front as possible with my battery, his only artillery, for the purpose of deceiving the enemy as to his strength. He therefore instructed me to post two guns on the right of the pike, two on the left, and the remaining two further to the left, where the 8th New York Cavalry was covering the left flank. It was just at the right of the guns last mentioned, in a corner of the woods, that General Reynolds was killed a few minutes later. I had scarcely completed the posting of this left section when Lieutenant Roeder opened on the right of the pike, his left piece being the opening gun, directed against a column beyond Willoughby's run, where our cavalry, dismounted, was stoutly resisting the advance of Hill's infantry. The other guns now opened, which drew the artillery of the enemy, 
and my four guns on the right were soon hotly engaged with Pegram's and Macintosh's battalions of artillery, numbering from 27 to 30 guns. Seeing the battery so greatly outnumbered, I directed the firing to be made slowly and deliberately, and reported to Buford what was in my front. The battle was now developing, and the demonic whir of the rifle shot, the ping of the bursting shell, and the wicked zip of the bullet as it hurried by filled the air. Riding to the guns on the left, I met General Buford, accompanied by Bugler only, and calmly smoking his pipe. He had just made an inspection of the field and remarked, Our men are in a pretty hot pocket, but, my boy, we must hold the position until the infantry come up. Then you withdraw your guns in each section by piece, fill up your limbal chests from the caissons, and await my orders. Just as he finished speaking, a shell burst so near to us that both of our horses reared with fright, but all escaped injury. By this time, the wounded were being brought to the rear, and temporary field hospitals were established in the vicinity of the seminary. Here also were my caissons. As I joined the left guns again, there came out of the McPherson woods, in our front, a double line of battle in gray, and not over a thousand yards distant. It was Archer's Brigade, and their battle flags looked redder and bloodier in the strong July sun than I'd ever seen them before. So part of the reason why Buford is able to mount a pretty good defense is that his men are are armed with single-shot carbines, which they put to good use. James Archer's Brigade and Davis's Mississippi Brigade are both going to deploy on either side of the pike and advance cautiously, the dismounted troopers giving way. To illustrate the heavy firing, the Tennessee troops in Archer's Brigade reportedly would fire and roll over on their backs to reload, and the retreating troopers would dip their hot carbines and willy be run as they passed. Holding a line on McPherson's Ridge, which was named as such for the McPherson farm, Buford was starting to contemplate a retreat. Rebels were pressuring him, and without help, he would have to collapse. At the right moment, John Reynolds would arrive and confer with his cavalry friend. Buford was atop the Lutheran Seminary, observing the situation. He would call out that the devil was to pay to Reynolds. Reynolds would ask if he could hold a little longer. The laconic Kentucky-born cavalry officer would reply, I reckon I can. The first corps would be hurried into position so they could deploy on McPherson's Ridge. Leading the way was the Iron Brigade, who would unfurl their banners and had their band strike up the Campbells are coming on their way into town. Amazingly, these troops had to march overland, around the town, in order to get where they needed to be. Wadsworth's next brigade under Lysander Cutler would also deploy, extending the line to the other side of the pike. It had been apparent to Heath that while the artillery dueled, he was facing more than militia. Now, it would be apparent to his infantry as well. Some of the cavalry would stay and fight with the Iron Brigade as they took up a position in Herb's Woods. The brigade was joined by the 24th Michigan for their first combat, and they would earn their stripes on the day. They will meet the veterans of James Archer. Now Archer is going to advance a little recklessly toward the enemy. Archer himself, though, is going to be not feeling particularly well and trail his men. The 24th and 19th Indiana will flank the rebels and hit them, capturing many, including Archer. Archer would give the famous line to Doubleday that he was not glad to see him for a damn sight when the latter expressed as such. Archer would be the first general officer under Lee to be captured, amazingly enough. Despite hitting Archer's brigade and seeing the Tennessee and Alabama boys reel back and pursued by the Midwesterners, the Wisconsin regiments in the brigade would take on heavy casualties. Another high-profile casualty would fall near these woods. John Reynolds had ridden forward to direct the Iron Brigade, and as he turned, he would be hit in the back of the neck and killed instantly. We have an account from an eyewitness. The general turned to look toward the seminary, I suppose to see if the other troops were coming on. As he did so, a mini ball struck him in the back of the neck, and he fell from his horse dead. He never spoke a word, or moved a muscle after he was struck. I've seen many killed in action, but never saw a ball do its work so instantly as the ball which struck General Reynolds, a man who knew not what fear or danger was, in a word, was one of our very best generals. Wherever the fight raged in the fiercest, the general was sure to be found. His undaunted courage always inspired the men with more energy and courage. He would never order a body of troops where he had not been himself or where he would not dare go. The last words of the lamented general spoke were, Ford men, for God's sake, and drive those fellows out of those woods. Like it or not, Reynolds is a big reason why Gettysburg plays out the way it does. He sends word back to Meade requesting assistance, stating he will barricade the streets if necessary. 
He also realizes that fighting north of town would be necessary if the better positions and high ground to the south of the town are to be secured. Meade will wish to get someone onto the field to take charge, so he's going to turn to Winfield Scott Hancock. Now, Hancock was not the next in terms of seniority, but Meade's capability as Army commander would allow him to bypass these usual channels and move officers around as he saw necessary. This will lead to a little bit of controversy later on, especially with the next First Corps leader, Admiral Doubleday, who takes immediate command of the troops. Meanwhile, on the other side of the pike, Cutler's brigade would meet Davis. Initially, they would make a stand, but the 55th North Carolina, a large regiment in Davis's brigade, would flank the Federal line and come smashing in on the right. Cutler's brigade was protecting some guns from the 2nd Maine under James Hall. Their collapse would pose a tempting target to the Magnolia Staters. The 147th New York, hailing mostly from Oswego, would stand closest to the guns. They would not receive the order to fall back, the officer delivering the verdict being killed before he could say so. As a result, the 147th would take heavy casualties, but ensure at least some of the guns were able to escape. Mississippi regiments would file after them through an unfinished railroad cut, a symbol of the potential prosperity as a crossroads town Gettysburg showed. From there, they could fire across an open field toward the Chambersburg Pike and enfilade the Union troops. Rufus Dawes, commanding the 6th Wisconsin of the Iron Brigade, was held in reserve. He would recognize the precarious position the 1st Corps was in now. Joined by the 95th New York and the 14th Brooklyn, the 6th would charge across an open field to drive the Confederates out. Now the railroad cut had steep banks, making it not so good a defensive position. But this does not mean the Union troops easily took the cut. In fact, the 6th would suffer almost 50% casualties in the charge. Once having gained the other side, the Mississippi men would surrender in masses, the Yankees in a good spot to fire down into them. Dawes reportedly had to enlist an orderly to carry the surrendered swords from the enemy officers. Importantly, the flank and the remaining guns from Hall's battery were saved as a result. Now we've actually done a memoir review on Dawes, but... He does give a very good first-hand account of the fighting here, especially at Gettysburg, and I'm going to read at least a little bit from that memoir. Went over the fences and in the field, and subjected to an infernal fire, I saw the 95th New York Regiment coming gallantly into line upon our left. I did not then know or care where they came from, but was rejoiced to see them. Farther to the left was the 14th Brooklyn Regiment, but we were ignorant of that fact. The 95th New York had about 100 men in action. Major Edward Pye appeared to be in command. Running hastily to the Major, I said, We must charge, and asked him if they were with us. The gallant Major replied, Charge it is. And they were with us to the end. Forward charge was the order given by both the Major and myself. We were now receiving a fearfully destructive fire from the hidden enemy. The men who had been shot were leaving the ranks in crowds. Any correct picture of this charge would represent a V-shaped crowd of men with the colors at the advance point, moving firmly and hurriedly forward, while the whole field behind is streamed with men who had been shot and who are struggling to the rear or sinking in death upon the ground. The only commands I gave as we advanced were, align on the colors, close up on that color, close up on that color. The regiment was being broken up so that this order alone could hold the body together. Meanwhile, the colors were down upon the ground several times, but were raised at once by the heroes of the color guard. Not one of the guard escaped, every man being killed or wounded. 420 men started as a regiment from the turnpike fence, of whom 240 reached the railroad cut. A lull in fighting would welcome reinforcements to the field. The remainder of the 1st Corps would start to deploy, George Stone setting up to the right of the McPherson farm along the ridge. Now Stone had served in the Bucktails, and some of his regiments had donned the Bucktail in their hats, even with the nickname Bogus Bucktails following them around. Their fighting on the first day would make up for it. Oliver O'Howard was now going to be in command for the Union troops as the 11th Corps started to show up. Now say what we will about Howard and his 11th Corps, but like Reynolds, Howard is going to share the vision that Gettysburg's terrain will make it a good place to fight. While Barlow's division, as well as Schur's, advance forward, he will retain a brigade from Adolf von Steinwehr under Orland Smith, and plant them squarely on Cemetery Hill, a little south of the town. 
This commanding height south of the town was the perfect spot for artillery. Now we should maybe mention the terrain a little bit, to the south of the town especially, and maybe that might paint a good picture for us. Cemetery Hill extends into Cemetery Ridge that trails roughly north to south. The hill could be anchored by Culp's Hill a little to the east. Further south would be more high ground that will come to be known as Big Round Top and Little Round Top, making for the famous fish hook. But you'll have to wait until day two for that. North of the city, though, Oak Ridge was apparent to Howard to be of great importance. While Doubleday shored up McPherson's Ridge, this is where he would direct his men to go, observing from the top of a store in Gettysburg. We should point out that the Union troops showed great stamina in getting to the field. Many of them saw hard marches in July heat, and in the case of the 1st and 11th Corps, then had to fight a battle at the end of it. Some of the troops were even denied stopping to get water, so great was the race against time. Speaking of time, it's time for Lee to arrive on the field. Now, if you ask someone who worked for you who was responsible for a task or project what was happening with that task or project, and they said they didn't know, that's probably not a good thing. Well, A.P. Hill essentially says that when Lee asked him what all those sounds of battle were. He would arrive to the field with the intention to keep from bringing on a full engagement. However, Lee is going to see an opportunity. With Heath and Pender on the field from Hill and Ewell arriving in the form of Rhodes and Early, he had a numerical advantage. I will point out as well that this is all part of the plan. He could defeat the two corps before him and then see about the others in detail. Hindsight being what it is, the 3rd Corps under Sickles was underway, and the 12th Corps under Slocum were dragging their feet, where they would soon arrive at the field, so it was better to finish off what was already on the plate before seconds. Besides, it was probably too late to disengage. Ewell had already deployed, and Rhodes unwisely had announced his arrival to the Yankees by placing guns on Oak Hill and firing off a few rounds. It was time to support the course of action as best he could. It is worth pointing out that the Confederates coming from the north would see the flank of the 1st Corps and the 11th Corps seemingly preparing to attack them, so the situation on the ground is probably very different. John Robinson's division of the 1st Corps would try to plug the gap between themselves and the 11th Corps arriving. His two brigades, one under Gabriel Paul and the other under Henry Baxter, would deploy to meet Rhodes and his fresh attackers. Gabriel Paul, you remember from New Mexico, would actually split his brigade to support the flanks of Baxter. The 45th New York from the 11th Corps would do good work arriving to the field and beginning to skirmish with the enemy. Hubert Dilgert's battery, who we met at Chancellorsville, would also do good work in arriving and deploying, dispelling some of the misconceptions that none of the 11th Corps performed well during the battle. Rhodes would send his Alabama brigade under Edward O'Neill and North Carolinians under Alfred Iverson. O'Neill would have miscommunications with his commander, Rhodes having taken direct control of the placement of one of his regiments. O'Neill thought that he would continue to exercise that control, and so only a proportion of his brigade moved forward. Rhodes had the intention of advancing both of the brigades together, which they did not. They were unable to support Iverson, whose troops marched past hidden men under Baxter. Robinson actually does a good job of shifting Baxter to meet this new threat. At the time, Baxter's troops would rise from a small stone wall and hit Iverson with devastating fire directly into the flank. Many of the men were reportedly found dead in a straight line, and we have an account here. The brigade, about 1,450 strong, advanced under artillery fire through the open grass field in gallant style, as evenly if on parade. Our brigade commander, Iverson, after ordering us forward, did not follow us in that advance and our alignment soon became false. There seems to have been utter ignorance of the force crouching behind the stone wall. For our brigade, to have assailed such a stronghold thus held would have been a desperate undertaking. To advance southeast against the enemy, visible in the woods at that corner of the field, exposing our left flank to an infilating fire from the stronghold was fatal. Yet this is just what we did. An unwarned, unled as a brigade, went forward Iverson's deserted band to its doom. Deep and long must the desolate homes and orphan children of North Carolina rue the rashness of that hour. 
When we were in point-blank range of the dense line of the enemy rose from its protected lair and poured into us a withering fire from that front and both flanks. This affected the enemy moving under cover of the ridge and woods, disposed his forces to enfilade our right from the woods just as our left was enfiladed from the stone fence. Pressing forward with heavy losses under deadly fire, our regiment, which was the second from the right, reached a hollow or low place, running regularly north and east, southwest through the field. We were then about 80 yards from the stone fence to the left, and somewhat further from the woods to the right, from both of which, as well as from the more distant corner of the field in our front, poured down upon us a pitiless rifle fire. Unable to advance, unwilling to retreat, the brigade lay down in this hollow, or depression in the field, and fought as best as could. Terrible was the loss sustained, our regiment losing the heaviest of all and killed. As from its position in line, the cross-inflating fire seems to have been the hottest just where it lay. Major C.C. Blacknall was shot through the mouth and neck before the advance was checked. Lieutenant Colonel R.D. Johnson was desperately and Colonel D.H. Christie mortally wounded as the line lay in the bloody hollow. There too fell every commissioned officer save one. The carnage was great along our whole line, which, except the 12th Regiment on the right, was at the mercy of the enemy. The fighting on this part of the line was prolonged and fierce. One of the Massachusetts regiments actually has an empty cartridge box on its monument, marking the fact that they ran out of ammunition during the fighting. George Doles and Junius Daniel of Rhodes Division would still stand, though, ready to renew a potential assault. They would be joined by Early's Division, deploying in the area of Rock Creek. Now, before Rock Creek was a small rise known at the time as Blocker's Knoll. This position would seem good to Francis Barlow, so he would advance his line from around the town's almhouse to this rise. Barlow is recorded as not thinking too highly of his mostly German troops, so it might be considered by the New Yorker and Harvard man to be a better spot. Barlow was actually looking for a command in the new regiments of black soldiers rather than continue to serve with the Germans. He could also be throwing it in the face of Carl Schurz, who takes command of the Corps. George Doles and his Georgians were in the vicinity, as was a battalion of sharpshooters, so it's also likely that Barlow was driving them away. Unfortunately for Barlow, this made an exposed position for the 11th Corps, especially with the weight that was about to be thrown on them from early. John Gordon, commanding veteran Georgia troops, would spearhead the attack. Barlow's men would stand for a time, but von Gilsa's men, without support, would eventually crumble. Francis Barlow would be wounded and left behind by his men. Reportedly, Gordon would stop and give him aid, taking him to a place of shade at a nearby tree. Before the battle's ultimate conclusion, Barlow was actually considered to be dead, but he would be recovered when the Confederates left him behind on the 4th. They actually left him behind partly because they figured he was too badly wounded. Bayard Wilkerson, son of journalist Samuel Wilkerson, would be wounded commanding a battery during the fighting, for what will become known as Barlow's Knoll. Wilkerson, though, would perform a field amputation on his own leg with a pocket knife, showing his courage. So think about that for a moment, because he obviously did not have anything to help him with that. And it's kind of like, if you've ever seen 127 hours, it's probably fairly similar to that. All he has is a pocket knife. With Von Gilsa collapsing and Ames taking command of the division, Schimmelfennig was left alone to face Doles, collapsing before him as well. A brief stand was made at the almshouse, the original line, but Gordon and Avery, as well as Doles, had all the momentum and brushed them aside. Krasinowski would not be able to stop the assault, his brigade being roughly dealt with as well. Charles Coster's brigade was stationed at Coon's Brickyard and would be overwhelmed by the Confederates as well. His position was not a good one for a potential flanking move, which Avery and Gordon would do. There were to be an account of these retreats and imagery of being shot in a quote from the 82nd Ohio. A moment or two later, I too felt the sting of a bullet and felt benumbed with pain. It was an instantaneous metamorphosis from strength and vigor to utter helplessness. 
the man nearest me being called to for assistance, reply by a convulsive grasp at the spot where a bullet that instant struck him. He passed on, limping as he went, and in a few minutes more, the last blue blast had disappeared, and the field swarmed with gray Confederates. So he's going to actually, we're going to continue on a little bit further through the quote here. Some of the artillerymen, having noticed the danger I was in of being trampled by the horses, two of them very gently removed me to a place of greater safety, supporting my arms on the friendly shoulders of these men and listening to their rough words of sympathy. I could not but feel that they were, after all, both fellow men and fellow countrymen. I wonder how we could be, or rather have been, such deadly enemies. They next brought Lieutenant B., and laid him near me. His sufferings were terrible, and his cries of pain agonizing to listen to. The Confederate artillerymen spoke to him, sympathetically, and their bronze faces expressed sincere compassion. They endeavored to arrange for him an easy posture, but in vain, all postures were alike painful. They procured water, which he demanded incessantly, but it served only as an emetic. Nothing could alleviate his intense thirst, abrogated as it was, alike by the fever of his wounds and by the excessive heat of the sun. So it's always good to hear there are uh, several accounts like this of just compassion by the part of both sides. And obviously, I want to highlight a couple things. You know, obviously, it's a pretty pell-mell retreat that starts to unroll here. And there are many who get left behind and captured. And also, we keep maybe forgetting, right? Or maybe, especially if you're listening to this not in July, in the heat, then maybe you don't understand that they're all suffering from the same conditions where water is going to be at a premium. So that's also something we should point out. Like dominoes, it would be John Robinson's turn to fall back after the right flank fell. Stephen Ramsier's brigade would assault the positions held by Robertson. Gabriel Paul would be severely wounded in this fighting, having his eyes shot out, wounds that would eventually claim his life, although he lived for some time afterward. Things were not going to look good to the Union troops. The 11th Corps was collapsing, and the 1st Corps was pressured from the west. Needing to buy time for the rest of his command to retreat, Robinson would command the 16th Maine of Paul's brigade to act as a forlorn hope. The brave Maine boys would stand as long as possible before being swept up by the Grey Tide. Only 38 of them would make it out without being captured. Officers reportedly drove their swords into the ground to break them rather than have to surrender them to the enemy. The regimental flags were torn into pieces to deny the enemy further a prize. Commanding the 16th Maine was Colonel Charles Tilden, who was captured, but will escape by tunneling out of Libby Prison, something we're going to talk about in 1864. Elsewhere, Daniel would charge toward the railroad cut and be briefly stopped by Stone, the 149th Pennsylvania in particular making a stand, but they would be pushed back, Stone being wounded in the process. Northern sectors of the line were collapsing, so now the western sections of the Union forces were being rolled backward. Fighting on McPherson's Ridge would continue, even with Doubleday having received orders to retire. It is possible he either did not get the orders or that he did not understand the German courier. The Iron Brigade and that of Chapman Biddle would see renewed assaults from Pender and the remnants of Heath. Biddle was actually drunk and would not command his brigade, this honor falling to Thomas Rowley. In these later stages, we have the drawn-out fight with Pettigrew's brigade. The 26th North Carolina would be torn up in the firefight. Their colonel, known as the Boy Colonel, Henry Bergwin, being mortally wounded in the action. The 26th would lose 549 of 843 in the assault. Amazingly, the remaining 230 men would be called upon on July 3rd to take part in Pickett's charge. From the battle, they will walk away with only 79 men. The 24th Michigan, amongst the other regiments, fights hard, and for a time would duel with the 26th North Carolina in this part of the field. The 24th, along with the 19th Indiana, had advanced almost to Hare's Ridge, which is where, if you look at a map, the Confederate jump-off point was. Harry Heath, during these stages, is actually struck by a ball in the head. Newspaper that had been stuffed into a hat, a hat that 
he had actually captured as part of the spoils of war. He needed it to fit properly, so he stuffed some newspaper in there, reportedly actually saved his life, although he is concussed and could not command. We should also mention one of the more famous stories from the battle. 1812 veteran John Burns joining the Iron Brigade for a time in their defense of this area. Now, there are other accounts, too, that we should mention. There are other mentions of civilians joining into the fight, whether they were militia. Um, there is actually one account that I saw of a, a free man, a, a black man who joins into the fighting, although there's not a whole lot of detail on him. Obviously, John Burns kind of takes the cake and, shall we say, represents a lot of these civilians that maybe either joined into the fighting. And obviously, there's a lot of aftermath and the fallout so we can kind of give a nod to them as well you know it's obviously things are going to change if your town has been subjected to the largest land battle on the continent burns actually went to join stone's men first but was passed on to the black hats instead he would join them for a time before being wounded in the fighting and return home Amazingly, the Confederates would believe him to have just been caught up in the crossfire and not a combatant when they arrived at his house. Abner Perrin, South Carolinians, and Alfred Scales, North Carolinians, from Pender would eventually drive the Union defenders back toward the seminary. So, the seminary is actually open uh, as part of your Gettysburg experience. It's a good, worthwhile visit, especially if you're interested about the first day. Uh, so then you can actually kind of see the terrain and kind of that section of the first day's battle. You can see where the direction of McPherson's Ridge and how that position being also a little bit elevated would be a natural fallback point. And I do believe at some point they do give tours, not every day or you can't just walk up there, but I do believe they give tours of the cupola as well. Um, and that is also well into the battlefield lore of of Gettysburg. Artillery that had been stationed near the seminary would inflict heavy casualties on Scales and his men. The 52nd North Carolina would flank this new northern stand, some of the Yankees having put together some hastily built breastworks. The 80th New York would stand for a time from Biddle's brigade, but they too would soon fall back through the town. Speaking of Biddle, though, we just have to have another small note on Buford. While some histories say his day is relatively finished, it should be noted, too, that his cavalry protect the left flank of the army. In fact, as some of Pender's men advanced to hit Biddle on the flank, Buford's cavalry would threaten them, forcing the infantry into a square, something you saw more readily on Napoleonic battlefields than in the American Civil War. His men would continue to fight dismounted, and take probably their heaviest casualties in this sector of the battlefield, delaying Pender's men. Buford will fall back and do more work in keeping the Confederates at bay. His men would eventually bivouac at the Peach Orchard, before being sent away to secure lines of supply. Their part in the story of the battle was to be finished, even though they were probably needed on the second day to protect the Union flank. But I want to just point out that in our triumvirate of figures who saved the Union army on the first day we need to add Buford to Reynolds and Howard. Buford would unfortunately die of typhoid before the conclusion of the war. His contribution, I think, is something to be worth pointing out, though. And in one of the craziest ironies, like, if you go to the battlefield at Gettysburg, in one of the craziest ironies, right, uh, Buford has his monument. He's not mounted on a horse. Or so go figure. <laughs> but he does have his binoculars, obviously. I think that's a good metaphor for Buford, right? Like, he's constantly looking to see if the Confederates are on their way. So that, at least, I think is fitting. But, you know, he's not on his horse. And a lot of the infantrymen are on their horses, but he's he's the cavalryman there that's not. So go figure. Their retreat back through the town was pretty chaotic. Men would stream through alleyways and in some places be hidden by civilians. General Schimmelfinnig actually hid behind some wood for three days we have an eyewitness civilian account of the rout. A strange and awful spectacle followed in those same streets at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Overwhelmed, beaten, completely routed in their conflict with Yule's command, they fled back through the town in wild disorder. 
There were 2,500 men made prisoners in the streets before our eyes. Our family now took to the cellar, where a window afforded a partial view. In the rear of the fleeing, routed troops, the artillery lingered, turning now and then to fire a deterring shot, and, as best it might, protect the despairing retreat. But the Confederates kept at their very backs. As I stared from the window, I saw a Union soldier running, his breath coming in gasps, a group of Confederates almost upon him. He was in full flight, not turning or even thinking of resistance. But he was not surrendering either. Shoot him, shoot him, yelled a pursuer. A rifle cracked, and the fugitive fell dead at our door. One after another fell, that way in the grim chase from the Carlisle Road. There came a lull in the stream of runners and their hunters. Then came a thunderous pounding fell upon our door by fists and boots. I ran upstairs. One of our own Pennsylvania bucktails, named Burlingame, wounded in his leg, was there supported by a group of his comrades, who would not desert him, and demanded shelter. We took him in with two of the others who said they would stay with him. Half an hour later, a detail of Confederates arrived and insisted on searching the house. It was impossible to conceal the wounded man. They found him in Father's study. His comrades, they ferreted out of the cellar. Those they took with them, prisoners. But Burlingame, they allowed to remain with us because of his wounds. By 5 o'clock that Wednesday afternoon, Gettysburg was fully in possession of the enemy. Dole's brigade of Rhodes' division and Ewell's corps quartered itself in our immediate neighborhood. They tore down all our fences and let the troops pass readily, but the harshest critics would find it difficult to find fault with their conduct. They were Georgians, all gentlemanly, courteous, and as considerate of their townspeople as it was possible for men in their position to be. Many of the Confederates would stop as they pressed the Union through the town. Yule, it was said, could be found in the town square, not pressing the advantage. Some 3,000 Union troops were taken prisoner, though, so this probably added to the fact that you get the feeling that maybe the work was done for the day, right? This is also very similar to, say, Chancellorsville, right? It's, it's the same guys, it's the 11th Corps, there's a lot of captured, even though we got some 1st Corps mixed in there probably as well, but sort of a similar scenario, and these guys from Stonewall's command had just been through it. So regardless of whether Ewell understands the importance of having to press the advantage, there are actually some writings of the troops realizing that, saying, hey, we just went through this in Chancellorsville and we had to get chopped up the next day to realize we should have kept up the advantage, yeah, even though Stonewall Jackson got shot. There would still be some house-to-house -house fighting as well. We should illustrate this with a quote, although... I'm not 100% sure this is from the first day, but gives us a good idea. Eugene's men had cut passageways through the partition walls so that they could walk through the houses all the way from one cross street to the other. From the windows of the back rooms, against which were piled beds and mattresses, and through holes punched in the outside back wall, there was kept up a continuous rattle of musketry by men stripped to the waist and blackened with powder. It was a strange sight to see these men fighting, in these neatly and sometimes elegantly furnished rooms, while those not on duty reclined on elegant sofas or stretched themselves out upon handsome carpets. I was surprised to see in some houses feathers scattered everywhere in every room, upstairs and downstairs, and found it had been done by shells bursting in feather beds on the upper floor. Pools of blood in many places marked the spots where someone had been hit and laid out on the carpets, and here and there a dead body, not yet removed, and many great holes in the walls, showed where artillery had been brought to bear upon the hornet's nest when their sting became too severe for endurance. I inquired for Major Blackford. Blackford's actually commanding a battalion of sharpshooters, I should say. That's not part of the quote. That's me talking. And was directed to a room in the middle of the block where I found him and some of his officers lolling on the sofas in a handsome parlor. On a marble table were set decanters of wine, around which were spread all sorts of delicacies, taken from a sideboard in the adjoining dining room, where they had been left, and in their hurry by the inhabitants where they fled before our advancing the day before. Outside could be heard the cannonade and the growl of musketry around Cemetery Ridge, and echoing through the house the reports from the deadly rifles, puffing their little clouds of little blue smoke from the black windows, while the room was pervaded by the smell of powder. After I had partaken with great relish from the refreshments, Eugene showed me over his fortress, 
from the back windows by keeping duly out of sight of the watchful men in the rifle pits a short distance behind the houses. I could see all that part of the lines of the enemy. So there you go. It's actually, they mentioned the advance from the first day. So this is probably the second, maybe the third here. So that gives us a good idea of the impact that house to house fighting has on Gettysburg as well. Right? So that's something that you get a pretty good idea of if you were to go to Gettysburg. And in particular, there is a house called the Schreiber house museum that shows sort of the civilian impact as well as they have like a sniper's nest up in the attic, you know, that would have been where the Confederates would have shot at uh, the Union troops as they set up what would ultimately be their defensive position for the second and third day. So that's definitely one of those places that's worth a visit. I do recommend that. It's always a nice little tour there. So um, good if you're heading to Gettysburg. It is this moment of crisis that Hancock will arrive to the field. Now, the old story goes that Hancock saves the army on the first day, as he does every other day, supposedly. But it is actually Howard that does not want to, A, relinquish command, or B, give up the position. It's only after Hancock threatens to move the lines back toward where Meade wants them that Howard cooperates. Now, Howard is going to throw Doubleday under the bus probably trying to avoid getting the 11th Corps blamed yet again. As a result, Doubleday will not command the 1st Corps, and thus be ever against Meade for the slight. Probably unfair, Doubleday does actually a pretty good job with the 1st Corps on the first day, but obviously Howard is going to be able to spin a narrative and try to make sure that his men, and particularly him, are not getting blamed for another collapse. Slocum and the 12th Corps would actually arrive as well, Slocum becoming the ranking officer on the field, but he doesn't do a whole lot. The traditional Union line was starting to form up, the fishhook taking shape. Cemetery Hill, still held by the 11th Corps men, was going to be the anchor of the line. We will talk some on day two of the dispositions of the Federal Army, but we should point out a couple of things. When Meade finally arrives on the field near the gatehouse of the cemetery, he will ask his officers if it is a good position. They will reply in the affirmative. Meade, who is only days into his command of the army, will reply that he hopes so, because there is no alternative. In my mind, it is more evidence how Reynolds, who, detesting the fact that rebels had invaded his home state, forces the hand of his superior, although, again, there is a counter-argument for that, and that it's all part of Meade's overall strategy. He needs to find the enemy. He wants to fight in a strong position. He has one. But obviously it's not It's not the Pipe Creek line. And if we talk about the Pipe Creek line, if you've ever seen what that particular position would look like, it would not be easy for the Confederates to attack. So there's also an argument that they might not have even attacked him there. Lee might have just flanked around the position or tried to maneuver into a way in which he did not have to do a frontal assault there. Henry Halleck would point out to me that his position could be flanked, which is also interesting to me because it does play into the Confederate plan for day two. You can bet a topographical engineer like Meade is going to want to have the perfect position. Obviously, there are at least some flaws with the Gettysburg line. Speaking of the Confederates, though, we need to talk about their misstep at the end of the first day. The usual narrative is that the Confederates should have taken Culp's Hill when they had the chance. But Culp's Hill, which lay a little to the east of Cemetery Hill, was not in fact a very strategically valuable position, other than it overlooked the Baltimore Pike, a supply line for the Union. No, the advantage could have been pressed by either Ewell or A.P. Hill. It should be taken with a grain of salt, of course, because Lee does not want to bring on an engagement still. An option that is on the table for the Army of Northern Virginia is to disappear back beyond the mountains and pick a better battlefield that could be used to fight the defensive battle Longstreet wanted. All the Corps commanders for the Army of Northern Virginia are going to have subpar performances, so let's take a look at Hill and Ewell. Hill is going to claim his troops are in no condition to press the advantage and attack the Union forces cobbled together in a defense of Cemetery Hill. He does have Anderson's unused division, though, that could have been added into the fray. While it's true that Heat's division and Pender's both have seen heavy action, 
they might have been able to continue with this added weight. Both were interested in potentially waiting for Longstreet to give support. Yule, remember, is going to have his indecision play into the battle. Isaac Trimble will have the famous quote that if he was just given a brigade, he could have taken the hill. Trimble is going to be given two brigades and do far less on day three, so I'm a little skeptical of that. Lee gives Yule the infamously worded order to take the hill if practicable, which is an interesting phrase. When given the order, Yule still had three hours of daylight in which he could have decided to be practicable. Allegheny Johnson, his trailing division, would be given the task. However, there's no sense of urgency when communicating that, so Johnson takes his time. Additionally, extra Billy Smith is going to see phantom Yankees and wish to be cautious. With the Union Army spread out and no cavalry, it's hard to tell exactly where they would be coming from. Now, Yule is not going to believe Extra Billy to report, but he might be dragging his feet for Lee to give him concrete orders. There's also the possibility he simply does not want to fight in the waning light, like at Chancellorsville. There is no late assault. The Confederate's going to have to wait for the following day. You always have that kind of what if Stonewall Jackson had been there. And it's interesting, this is probably an order that Lee would have given Jackson had Jackson been there, and Jackson might have taken the initiative and then launched an assault. So in some ways, he's still operating under that kind of communication that he had with his subordinate. So if practicable, might have actually meant go ahead and take this hill, launch an attack. It's something that Jackson would have done. But obviously, when you have a change in personnel, you need to realize that everyone has a different way in which you want to communicate with them. Yule is going to be very different than Jackson in that regard. As the first day comes to a close, we see a Confederate victory, even if they suffered more battlefield casualties. The 1st Corps and 11th Corps were both severely sapped in strength, though, the remnants of the 11th taking up Cemetery Hill, and the 1st actually being shifted to Culp's Hill for the evening. As night fell, though, it was still anyone's game. And with that we can officially draw close to day one. I'm not going to do a whole lot in terms of wrap-up because we still have part two to get to. We still have day two of Gettysburg here, and that's going to be posted around the same time as this episode, so you can just go right into it, and then we'll come back the following week for day three and the conclusion of the battle. So thank you all so much for listening, and I hope to see you soon here with part two.